Well, we're going to start. And I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, this is kind of a dream of mine, and I'm glad it's full. We started at the Black of Carmen, Black and White, and it's come a long way. And uh, it means an awful lot to me, and I want these the younger people to realize who these people are and to listen to stories. I'll introduce them. They can pass the baton down, tell a little history, this and that. There's some on the audience that doesn't want to talk, but they're be up at the stage, and I'll talk to them. And then we're going to have questions and answers. And uh, first, I'll start. Wink Eller, Al Lamb, Warner Riley, George Smith, Dan Kinsey, Bud Schmidt, Pete Hill, Michael Markowski, John Gates. And then we have some in the audience. Jim Weinweber, right here. Ron Dickey. Dan Paisley. Wayne Pinkle. And Bill Blair. Okay. We you to start, start the ball rolling and tell a little bit about yourself. And uh, yeah, we can hand the microphone down to Wink. I got to work. Okay. So this is Wink Keller. Thank you, everybody. You got to turn it on. Slide it up. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, Santa Claus. You know, he had a good idea. All the time I worked with the SCTA, we had a thing, and I always try to keep the spirit of the rule going for all the racers. And uh, all the time that I spent on the board, I got in a lot of trouble a lot of times. And, you know, a lot of people didn't go to bat for me, but there was a lot of people that are still there in place that did go to bat for me. And for the motorcycle, you know, I won a championship in 96 at El Mirage and the SCTA for, since 1949, had given everybody a, two lifetime memberships. And uh, so I got, I won the championship and it was uh, Keith McKibben, John McKibben's son, rode my bike and I tuned it and uh, we set more records and uh, more points than anybody in the history of SCTA since 1949. We set 2,836 points for the season. We broke six records, one record each meet, and actually bumped four of the records after the second run of each meet. And uh, so we went to the banquet and uh, they said, well, you're a motorcycle guy, so you only get one lifetime membership. And I, you know, I was a little disappointed at first, and I thought, I wonder why that is. We pay the same entry. And uh, so we looked at the books, and we found out that if it wasn't for us, our community, the SCTA would have went bankrupt a long time ago. The motorcycle committee had more entries when Santa Claus and I were racing there early, we had more entries to the motorcycle than the car guys. And then, the reason we knew that was, is because we had four times as many classes with records in them in the book. And if you get a SCTA book up and you open it up, well, I hated being called a bike guy and a car guy. I said, I'm not, we're racers. And I said, we have race vehicles. And they all go through scrutineering. And it should be all the same. Well now, the white guys get two, well, they get two championship lifetime memberships now. And that's because of Mike Cook. And, and me just, you know, being the stubborn guy that I am. So, but, uh, You know, and, and I, I was so stubborn, I stayed behind it, and I did it. 
So anyway, I haven't been to an SCTA meet in a long time because I've been pretty sick and I've been able to come up here, but I decided I was coming to the SCTA meet this year to get a tune-up on the new bike that we built over the winter while I wasn't in the hospital. And uh, we took it to El Mirage. I didn't go. I, I tuned it on the dyno and just guessed a little bit on the, on the tune-up. And Chris took the bike up and he put 43 miles an hour on the record. And I said, that's a good job. So <laughs> what you need to do is just forfeit the record and just come on back home and tell them we're going to come back the first of next year and then we'll run it all year long up there. And I'm going to tune it for you. So, and, you know, fortunately it's got an SS motor in it, a little 4x4, four four, little 100 inch motor in it. It's got a Pro Charger on it. So we got a call from Jody Perowitz. And, she called up Chris and she said, what size is that motor? And he said, a 1650. And she goes, why are you going after my class? And Chris goes, no, we're, you're, you borrowed that record. And now we want to borrow it. And we'll just give you some friendly competition. And he's a young little chap, but he's a real good kid, you know? And, and uh, so we've been at the shop working and, you know, when I, when I can, but uh, on the way up here from, uh, I hit an elk in Ely on the way here in my roadster out there and uh, spent seven days and uh, they life flighted me to uh, Las Vegas Memorial and uh, after waking up after two and a half days I got to talk to my wife and hey, she thought I got hurt on another bike at Bonneville. <laughs> and, uh, she was mad at me and I said no hey we they, the meet got canceled. I didn't even make it there. I made it to Ely, and that's as far as I got. And so, of course, you know, uh, she was a little bit upset with me. She says she doesn't know what she's going to do with me because I'm that old kid that doesn't, I refuse to grow up, she said. But I said, well, but, and she said, you know what, I support you 100%, whatever you want to do. And so I said, she said, what's your plan? And I said, well, you guys got to hurry up and get me home because I got to work on my roadster because I'm going back up to Bonneville for, for, doing this, for the uh, Del Means meet. So here I am. How do I follow that? <laughs> um, I'm Al Lamb. I'm the current sit on FIM AMA record holder at 262.4. Um, Santa Claus came and asked me, he said, why don't you come to the Legends thing? I said, well, I'm no legend. I'm just, I'm just a motorcycle rider. He said, when'd you start riding? I said, I started racing in 72. He says, you're old enough. <laughs> so I started out racing at a, at a short track in outside of Dallas, Texas called Ross Downs. A lot of, a lot of riders cut their teeth there. Uh, I told him to sit on a Saturday night there. You'd see Terry Poovey and Freddie Spencer and Bubba Schobert and it wasn't unusual for just a normal Saturday night program or Friday night program to have 10 or 12 national numbers there. And I said, you know, I said, I was a decent rider, but compared to those guys, I was, uh, I was a slug. So my career didn't last too many years doing that. And I got out and got in the motorcycle business, which meant I couldn't go race anymore because I couldn't leave work. So that ended that. And uh, I stayed, stayed off the bike racing for about 25 or 30 years, race cars. I raced everything from open wheel cars to 10 M cars to IMSA and Grand M cars. And then uh, my girlfriend said, we went and saw the world's fastest Indian. She goes, I want to do that. <laughs> I said, you want to do what? So I want to race one of those. I said, you're kidding. I said, what do you want to race? I want to race a turbo high boost. <laughs> I thought, now I don't know who's crazier. She or she or I. So need to say we built a turbo high boost. So she came out here and bailed off of the first year, got the $13,000 helicopter flight. I said, you learn to fly? He said, no. I said, for 13 grand, you should learn to fly. <laughs> so, needless to say, I was building bikes for her to ride out here. And then um, in 2010, she rode the, the Honda that I built. And she was riding the production bike also. And then 2011 came along. She goes, well, I, I'm not going to ride the turbo bike. I'm going to ride the production bike and work on just concentrate on that record. I said, okay, I'll ride it. So, 
you know, the record for class is 218, and I thought, golly, maybe I can go 219 or 220. And I was a little nervous about that. And we were in, uh, we were in SCTA, and we were in the Bubba event that year, and then we went to the cook meet, and by the end of the cook meet, we'd bump the record to 245. And so while we were there, I told, them, told my, my crew guys, I said, I said, guys, we can go 265. And they said, you're crazy. I said, we can go 265. So we went back to the shop, wrote that on the wall, and went back the next year, and our return run on the record was 265.4. So, you know, this, this is a, a great organization. I can't think of anything better than being here. And I'm, this, I'm here this year, no, no bike, no trailer. Everybody says, what are you doing? So I'm here to help people. So I'm here to help maybe whoever break my record. So, you know, I've never been in, in a group of people that's any warmer, any more giving, any more caring. And I'm just proud to be here. And sit up here amongst these guys, it's like, man, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm really lucky to even be considered to be up here and talk with So, thank you. sure what to talk about. <laughs> My name is Warner Riley. I live in Northern Illinois. I've been coming to Bonneville 50 years. I first came here in 1964 with my friend Jim Lineweber and here it's 2014. I never imagined that year we were here that it would lead to this. I've tried to race most of the years here. That doesn't mean I've been here 50 times uh, and had moderate success. Uh, it's always been with the Harley Davidson. Uh, thanks to SNS, some of it's been with a fuel sportster that managed to go as fast as 212 miles an hour in 1972, get me into the 200 mile an hour club. We also worked on the Streamliner in 1970, the Harley Davidson effort, Dennis Manning, Cal Rayburn, uh, myself, George Smith, um, people from the Harley Racing Group, and that record was the direct result of the uh, Bob Pan Triumph, the, Cal the uh, Rick Vesco's Yamaha, and then the Harley Davidson. And, uh, because Harley was behind all that, we got a tremendous amount of press and enjoyment <coughs> and longevity from that record. That was quite nice. I have some other things, but I think I want to wait till later when we uh, feature our special guest. Would I be right? Okay. Thank you. George Smith, not to be confused with George J. Uh, a lot of people call me Junior. I'm not really Junior. My dad, uh, George J., founded SNS along with my mom. And uh, I, I chose a little bit different route. I, I kept up with two wheel vehicles though. When I was 13 years old, I bought an American motor scooter basket case. I don't know if you remember that that was a humpback with a two and three tenths horsepower Briggs in it. A bushel basket. And then, uh, then I had a Harley 125 and then when I was 16 I had my first hog, uh, which was a 48 pan. We found a hybrid glide front end for it. And uh, I managed to stay current with motorcycles. I worked for a printer for 18 years. From age 18 to 36, and uh, 1970, I almost joined forces with my dad. Uh, I came up there, came up to uh, Viola, and uh, he and I weren't ready for each other yet. So I went back to families and spent another nine years. And then finally, uh, in 1979, I, I came up and joined them in uh, June. Back in those days, there was probably about 15, 20 people working at s, &S. We were maybe doing a million bucks a year. But uh, I went my first trip to Bonneville. That was uh, September, August of 79. <coughs> and uh, I can remember my dad was running a two-throat carburetor, and he had run pretty well the year before, 144 with a 98-inch uh, shovel bed. 
and it didn't work too well in 79, so he was pretty rejected. So uh, he, uh, he died suddenly in 1980, and then I was put in a position of uh, trying to pick up the pieces. Luckily, we had Floyd Baker, Dan Kinsey, and several other guys there, and worked out pretty well. Um, I was looking through some old tapes, and uh, I noticed Dan Baisley was, when we were, we were trying to have the first bike to go to the sevens, remember, Dan? And you had that one with the four carburetors on there. We had David Fiesel, and you turned the 797, and yes, good experiences. So I had a combination of drag racing and, uh, and Bonneville racing. 1981, Dennis Manning called me and said, do you want to go racing? And I figured, well, that'd probably be the best way for me to learn about going fast, go to Bonneville. So the deal was we were going to build Tram as an engine test bed for the streamline. So we, we did build Tram and uh, it turned out to be a real good piece. I decided to uh, use an old uh, gas welder guy, Andy Petrusic from World War II days used to gas weld aluminum like an artist and he uh, converted two shovel heads to me so we were running uh, two shovel heads like uh, like the XR yeah XR 750 and uh, to give you an idea the intake flowed 137 CFM at 10 inches which is terrible the exhaust flowed about 109 we made 134 horsepower at the crank, yet we went 192 on gas. That's 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 cooking. Uh, Tramp was a, a very good piece. When you, and I'll talk about 262. In uh, 1991, I finally got the fuel thing figured out. We came down here and went uh, 239. The rear wheel thought we were going 272, and. Uh, we took it back to Viola, made a few corrections, and, and came back for a, a late October or November trip. We got as far as Gillette, Wyoming, started rain, uh, snowing in the rig where the meet was called, so Tramp never ran again. But if there was ever a, a bike that was capable of really going quick, that was it. So, uh, let's see. I got involved in drag racing in 97 with Fazell because he was trying to win the number one plate, which we ended end up doing. And uh, then we decided to uh, work on the Pro Stock pro Project. I don't know if anybody's familiar with NHRA Pro Stock Racing, but there's a special purpose SNS engine that we, we designed that uh, we, we actually got the okay to start the project. April 26, 2002, I still remember the date. So me and a couple of other guys at SNS put together that engine based on a Sportster, four cam, 60 degree, five and an eighth bore, three and seven eighths stroke, and uh, got it approved. I teamed up with George Bryce and Sandy Cosman to get a chassis for it. And that, that bike is the same bike that we run today that qualifies 10 or 11 bikes out of the NHRA. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, I've met really wonderful people. When I was working at Donnelly's uh, in Chicago, big printing company, I had a good time, but I never really knew what it was like to work with true sportsmen, racers, and friends. And I've had a I've had a really nice share. In 2008 was my last year to run uh, my own crew at the NHRA. I had in 2007 I had one of the best riders in the business, Chip Ellis. But Chip had problems on Sunday. And he just was uh, too much adrenaline. Either he's either red light or too late. So in 2008 I chose 
to work with Chris Rivas, who's kind of been my guy and my protege since then. And Chris could ride good on Sundays, and we, uh, <laughs> we, we, we missed the championship by, by five lousy points. But I'll tell you, I, I'll just tell you one little story. Pro stock racing is, uh, is really critical. There's so many different things that you've got to set to really do it right. And uh, while we, we, were, we were doing good in the, in the countdown, we won Dallas, we won Las Vegas, but the bike was not really re re performing right in Las Vegas, even though we won. So we go into Pomona in the final, and uh, I can't get the thing to run right. I make changes on the, uh, on the fuel system and the rest of it, and it's just not responding. So I came to the conclusion maybe I got a a virus in the computer, because you know it's all electronics now. Fuel injection, ECU, all the rest of that. So it's Saturday night, we qualified number nine. Graywick had qualified number two, so he picked up seven points on us just on qualifying position. So I decided to take every bit of electrical wiring off of that bike, and we took uh, Valerie Thompson's new uh, SNS Power Buell that we had just built for her. Took everything off of that and put it on ours. And I constructed a map. And uh, Chris goes out, wins the first round, wins the second round. Uh, I wasn't quite sure if it was Rich or Lean. So I, I, uh, I leaned it out a little bit and we went slower. But we still won the third round. So we got in the finals against Craywick. But I knew which way to go and uh, Chris drove it real well. And, we set low AT and high mile an hour. It was really fun. There's nothing like the feeling that you get when you can tune something and it sings and it's happy and you put it all together. It's, it's uh, anybody that races motorcycles is familiar with them. It's just a feeling that uh, is unsurpassed. I got a bum arm, I can't ride very well, but I sure like to do the mastermind and, and help. Uh, I got a ton of stories that I could tell you, but you don't have enough time. <laughs> All right. I'm going to pass the mic to Dan. <laughs>
we had guys watching for me along the road, so I'll make sure no one was coming and they'd wave me and I'd make another pass pass. So I come around the corner one day, getting ready to make another pass, and everybody's doing this. <laughs> there was some deer crossing the road there right in front of me. One other time I was testing the motorcycle and I went into Viola and turned around and come back out. I made a fast pass and went up the SNS cycle side road there and put it away. And a couple hours later, a friend of mine from town comes out and he says, uh, did he catch you? And I says, what do you mean? He said, the cop was after you when you left town. <laughs> Hell, I didn't even know. <laughs> anyway. So, um, some of the different things we've done, I've been uh, uh, the writer for the tramp and the streamliner. But uh, when Bonneville, I don't know what year it was, it got underwater and we couldn't race at Bonneville. So what was decided is we're going to go to Gerlach, Nevada. I don't know if anybody knows where that is, and I'm sure I don't anymore. But uh, it's a little place out on the lake bed. And uh, we were testing tramp and uh, out across that mud. It was just a dry mud a lake bed. And uh, we made a few passes and it was going better and better. And uh, one day I was uh, cooking down the mud flat and, and uh, testing ways to ride the motorcycle and trying to talk in and learn and do. And I looked out a little farther in front of me and yeah, there's a pickup truck coming right at me. And it was uh, one of the local farmers that come down his normal path to town was across the lake and he didn't know we were out there racing. It's hard to slow a motorcycle down when you're going over 200 miles an hour and we went by him just, just a book. Anyway, that's some of the experience. George was telling me a little while ago we were talking about some of the testing we had done. And I wouldn't admit to it, but sometime in my past, I guess I went pretty fast on Interstate 80, too, a couple of times. Anyway, uh, I'm really good to see uh, the, some of the young guys and gals come to the salt and learn to race. And uh, I really uh, think that's the future of our sport. We need to get behind the young people that want to race best we can and help them. Anyway, uh, I, I uh, commend the people who are doing that um, and think that, that more of it needs to be done. But if there's anything that, that we can do at SNS, or uh, to help you, um, then it's only a phone call. You have to call us. And if we can help you, um, I'd have to ask that guy in the back of the room first, but if we can help you, we will. And so they've been really good about uh, turning us loose to help people. And there's one thing that uh, I'll give up. I have a racing secret that I've kept from pretty much everyone, I guess. I haven't even told George this. <laughs> but uh, racing this, the tramp and the streamliner was always kind of scary for me. You get out there and you go at those kind of speeds. I was scared, I'll admit, I was really scared some of those times. So um, I figured out something that helped that. And uh, I figured if uh, when you're really scared, things are really scary and you're going down this old, a lot of people when they're scared, their eyes go wide open like this. I figured out I was only half as scared if I shut one eye. <laughs> anyway, you can take that to the bank. Uh, Foster Avenue in Chicago 
So he made a trip out to California. I'm going to give you a little history here. Yeah, California and talked to Andy Spindarian and uh, Big Al of Edelbach and all them big guys. And he saw the potential of the drag strip. Of course, all drag strips at that time were run by a club. So Andy, the promoter that he was, he started the Hot Rod Club in Chicago. So anyway, and I went to my first uh, meeting. I happened to be stationed in Fort Sheridan at the time, and I was riding a motorcycle, naturally. So anyway, I went to the first meeting, and then that would have been probably in November, but then in the spring, Andy started the drag strip, half-day drag strip, up north of Chicago. And anyway, and, and I was running a, a 49 Panhead Harley, and, and it had a Herbert Tam in it, a few good things. Anyway, and I run up there that year, and, and a guy by the name of George Smith was running up there at that time. Yeah, anyhow, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, and I, I may be a little off base here, but George Smith running the same class I did, and the reason I got that impression, we were both running 74s and probably in the same class, but I got beat most of the time, but I won a few trophies, and at one of their meets that we had, they had at Raceway, or Raceway Park in Indianapolis, I saw this trophy exactly the same as the one I've got. And I'm sure that was one of George Smith's. But anyway, so I decided I'm going to go home. And a lot of guys are running 80 inch Harley, and of course we wasn't in the same class. So I go home to back to Indiana, and I think, well, I'm going to build an 80 inch Harley. But I got to thinking, some of them South Side Chicago boys, they're pretty sharp, and they're going to be real ahead of this old farm boy. So I decided I'd put two inches in my motorcycle. Yeah. <laughs> I scooped him there, but then the next year, I brought the big Harley up, and, and uh, boy, uh, there, there wasn't a whole lot running, a lot of cars running, but this two-handed Harley, I had some problems with it, but not a lot, you know, and and it would just tear them up, you know, and the big 80-inch Harley, drop off the line and get me, and I, I was running a normal three-speed transmission with the low, low gear on that starting second seat, but when I went into high, it was just out of sight. And this one guy got off his motorcycle, he felt on his stop. But he really didn't. <laughs> you all missed that. Anyway, anyway that, that old Harley was running real good. And towards the end of the season, there was a guy by the name of Bob Chapman up there. And he ran a car. And he probably chopped an automotive. I don't know if anybody's from Chicago here. I know George probably is. But anyway, I was running a pretty 123, 124, and there was a dragster or two there running about the same speed. And Chapman came up to me and he said, Hey, Smitty, why don't you give it, put in some of my bug juice, you know? And I said, Okay, I had a wizard tank on that, and I generally use about a gallon when I make a run. So we dumped this bug juice in there, and he said, By the way, you better richen her up a little bit. The old Lincoln carburetors, of course, they had an adjustable main jet, and I gave it about two turns. And I, and I was running by myself, I wasn't running with nobody else. So I stormed that old rascal through and I thought, well, it didn't do any better than I ever did, you know. And I turned around and when I looked at my crew, they was all jumping up and down and going crazy. And I just set the track record at 129.87. <laughs> was six miles an hour the end of the dragsters and that one of them was Chapman and he said on oh, my bug juice too. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> but the next year then there was no place to run and the, the drag strip had closed. So anyway, and I didn't get to run anywhere and I got to thinking, I think I'm gonna run at Bonneville next year and I'm a gracious reader of Hot Rod Magazine. Of course SCTA started that in 39. So I get all tuned up and, and I Oh, I, I couldn't find a sprocket, and I, the only thing I was going to do was change the, uh, uh, the sprocket on the uh, transmission. So I could call Harley Davidson, they never heard of us, such a thing. So anyway, I thought, well, how hard, how hard can that be? That's only plate uh, eight inch uh, steel. So I went to the blacksmith shop and got a piece of steel, and I had my high school compass, and I knew the diameter from my slide rule. So I made a circle around there, and, and I thought, well, that chain, that chain, that's only a 3 8 pitch. So I just took a 3 8 drill and went around that and drilled it out and took a flat rat tail file and piled that down a little bit and went 187 down here at Bonneville.
great racer. I, I have to apologize for being here and never run Bonneville until last year. And uh, Link kind of uh, put me in the seat of his bike, which I never would let him ride my bike. <laughs> I got the chance to make a pass, and it was great. Uh, it was just like I expected. Uh, hard to get traction, and, and uh, yeah, a lot of throttle. And, and uh, so I got my experience one time down here. I hope someday I'll do it again. But my history is uh, drag racing. It started back in the late 40s, actually. We did some... Uh, uh, organized drag racing in the late 40s before that we were doing unorganized. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a little car club at home and uh, we got the use of a uh, abandoned uh, stretch of highway. And uh, we had a lot of hot rod cars that during the week was work cars for liquor haulers. <laughs> in my part of the country, there's a lot of that going on. So that was, there's a lot of hot rod um, haulers around, and uh, those guys thought just as much of the cars as any hot rod. And so uh, they had a chance to drag race. They were not in fours. But we could, we could dust them pretty easy on the bike. You know, I was running uh, Knucklehead, and uh, it progressed with uh, cams and multiple carburetors and two-speed transmissions and n no charging systems and no anything that didn't make it go, you know. So uh, I, I ran that till I went in Air Force in uh, 1950. And I came out, started racing again street mainly and um, in the early 60s I built a supercharged knucklehead um, fuel injected and uh, we learned how to break every part no <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> we probably was more responsible for making knuckleheads a rarity <laughs> Cost of them now. But we learned a lot along the way, you know, we beef up this and beef up that, and uh, we was running alcohol. And uh, then uh, I never run nitro in those days in the 60s. I run a little bit of nitro, but just enough to know that I didn't need to mess with it. <laughs> and then I, I, I was off racing for a few years, and then uh, the early 70s, I built back. And uh, when I I called uh, uh, Sifton Cams, uh, you know, Dick Hilferty was the owner of Sifton back then. And I told him what I was going to do. I was going to build a nitro, supercharged, knucklehead, drag bike. Well, he was a gentleman and didn't laugh at my face on the phone. But he told people later that he thought, well, this goofball down in the south is going to build a bomb and it's going to help kill it. <laughs> but I built it. And I had the background that he didn't know about, and we was fairly successful right off the bat. And this kept progressing and changing things and, and having a lot of fun doing it. Um, we had a lot of incidents. Uh, my wife did all the nitro uh, mixing because we, we didn't run 100% nitro. We, we blended it according to the uh, conditions. And we were down in Mississippi and uh, we had a money run, you know, the finals come up. And back then we cranked on the rollers. And uh, they, they said, crank them up. And I fired it up. And that thing was so violent, it was jumping off the rollers that I And uh, I turned around to my wife and I said, what you put in this thing? And she said, don't worry about it, ride the damn thing. <laughs> so uh, I 
I'm sitting on a bomb. <laughs> and uh, it's hard to lay down on lay down and back when you're sitting on a bomb. <laughs> uh, somehow I managed to win the round, or, or the race actually. And um, after that, I always conferred with her what was put in the <laughs> Sometimes it runs, you know, uh, I, I, had, I had originally had this Bell Star helmet. It had a little window. And I was, you know, I, I was proud of that helmet. when I bought it new. And I used it too long. And I was down some podunk drag strip, quarter mile. And uh, the lining, you know, padding kind of got loose. And I was making a pass and that dog on thing rotated. <laughs> and I couldn't see that my handlebar. <laughs> and I just held it straight. And, and I saw some things go by, and I thought that was the lights, and I shut it off. <laughs> uh, there was always things like that going on. Uh, uh, keep, keep you interested, you know. When, you know uh, so we had a lot, of, a lot of success, won five championships, top fuel, um, inducted into six Hall of Fames. And uh, I don't know why, but I took every honor and gracefully as I could, but I took them. <laughs> and we have been for people like George Smith, uh, keeping us going, you know, making better parts and styler stuff and listening to us because we, we give feedback. And so, George, this is not working for me and it makes something better. And uh, so we, my hat's off to s and for all the effort they've done for all the racing, different types, whether it's Bonneville, drag racing, whatever, ground track. Uh, I thank you, George, for, for everything you've done for us. My name is Mike McCloskey, and I uh, got my first motorcycle, a 45-inch Indian Scout, back in 69, and that was it. I knew I was hooked. So I went to work for American Indian Motorcycle Company, a guy named Sam Pierce out in Monrovia. Six months later, the guy decided to go back to medical school that had been building all the motors, and Sam said, you're the guy for the job. Built motors, about 120 power plants for him. Got tired of, of building old antiques, and all my pals were on Harleys. So I switched to Harley Davidson in 72. Went to work for a little shop called Sporter Motors. And uh, the guy was uh, Bob Pohl, was there, and Sonny Razlowski was the motor man there. And he decided to open his own place, so I took over the motor bench without Bob knowing it. He had gone out of town. And this guy named Tiny came in while Bob was gone. And he was nicknamed Tiny for a reason. He was big and he was pissed. And I go, what's the problem? He goes, I've gone through three sets of pistons in this damn thing in three months. I'm the new kid in town, right? Bob's out of, out of town. I go, well, I'll fix it for you. He goes, you will? I said, yeah. How long is this going to take? I said, well... Just a minute, I went and checked the record. She had 20 overboard. I go, how the heck do you stick three sets of pistons only got 20 over? He goes, well, my last two were 60 over. This is my third set of cylinders. I went and checked. We had a set of, of pistons on the shelf. So I said, I'll have it ready for you tomorrow. I'll come back at closing time. He goes, you're shit. I said, no, I'm not. That's pretty big, and I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> so, I worked a little late that night, talked to the guy that had the keys in the staying late, fit the pistons, fair, all right, I'll assemble it in the morning. Well, Tiny weighed about 340, 350. I'm dealing with pistons supposed to be set up to two and two and a half. Well, I set them up at two and three quarters because I know this guy's big. I put 50 miles on the bike and retorked it three times. Tiny shows up, he takes off. Tiny comes back next Saturday, gets off his bike, goes, nice job, kid. I went, thank you. Bob comes back to work two days later, 
And I'm not supposed to do no motor work because I'm the new guy there, but nobody else could do it. And Tiny wasn't having none of waiting. Bob comes back, says, well, how'd things go? I said, well, Tiny came in. Oh, no, not again. Yeah, again, Bob. Where's his bike? Oh, he's got it. Well, how, what do you mean he's got it? I said, I took care of it. You, you took care of it? I said, yeah. He goes, what'd you do? I told him how I checked the record. We had the piss and made a promise stuck to it. And he's happy with the job. You got the motor bench. Uh -huh. So I moved right up. And uh, then I got a lucky break. I was working for um, uh, Joe Scarborough at the time doing motors. I had a pretty good rep and uh, Chopper Magazine comes in with a bunch of boxes. I said, will you put this together for us? We want to do an article. I said, what is it? It's called an s, &S Sidewinder Kit. It's a new thing on the market. I said, really? Why'd you pick me? Well, March over in s, s says you're the guy out here. Okay. So this has picked up really good after that hit the rack. And uh, I continued with building motors. And, you know, in those days, you couldn't go out and buy a hot rod. You needed the guys that were building the parts in the industry to build a fast bike. s, &S was number one. And uh, a few years later, I bought the business out, started in 1979 to build a business. 1989, Keith Ruxin comes into my shop, and he wants me to set up four sets of rods, set them up. And he wants me to, to bore about 12 cylinders that don't have any fins on them. I go, all right, what's up? He goes, well, I'm working on a streamliner. I said, is that right? He goes, yeah. So about a month later, I see him at a wedding that a mutual friend of ours was having. And I go up to him and I said, hey, uh, you can't come to this town and build the fastest motorcycle in the world, have it be a Harley Davidson without my help. He goes, is that right? I said, that's right. He goes, are uh, you gonna be at Bonneville? I says, yeah, I'll be there. I'll be available 24 hours. When you need me, just call me. I don't sleep a lot, I don't drink. Don't worry about it. He says, you're hired. So I got into the streamliner business with Keith Ruxin, and uh, the first year we went out, we did uh, 284 miles an hour. Dave wrecked the thing and we were done. But we were in the game, knew what we needed to do. Came back, worked on it the next year. He set up two motors, I set up two motors. We went back. We had four extra top ends and we had four motors. At the time, the record was held by uh, a Yamaha at uh, 318 miles an hour. Uh, Don Vesco was the rider. Uh, after uh, 14 days, we got it done. Uh, the original motors that Keith built, we uh, kind of destroyed them getting the tuning done right. But uh, the ones I put together held, and we did an average speed of 322.150 miles per hour, which at the time was the fastest motorcycle in the world. And, and we're still the fastest Harley Davidson and the fastest normally aspirated motorcycle in the world. And, uh, I want to tell you, we gave s, s Supreme Rods the acid test and they passed. <laughs> they didn't fail in any of the motors, neither did their pistons and neither did their cranks. So uh, thank you guys for s, s for doing this stuff. And uh, over the years, I've never met you, George, but uh, your mom and, and your salespeople, uh, they've always been wonderful people to work with on the phone. I'm in Los Angeles, so I, I haven't met you folks, but uh, thanks a lot. And I'd also like to thank Santa Claus for all he's done for this event and putting us on. Apparently the mayor thinks he's a great guy too. Mike was, <laughs> Mike was telling me that he's going to go ahead and plant a an, uh, tree in the honor of, uh, of uh, Santa Claus. And I, I told him, forget about it, it ain't going to work. And he goes, what do you mean? I say, ain't going to live. He goes, you don't think so? I said, nah, the sap lives in Wisconsin. <laughs>
name is John Yates. I was with the land speed team with Warner and George Smith in uh, 1970, and I grew up with Dennis Manning. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I ran top fuel cars and funny cars and motorcycles, boats, drag boats, and that, and end But uh, in 1970, Dennis, we were on top fuel cars, and he said he needed some help, and we ended up at Bonneville, and then that's when all hell raised. Rayburn, if anybody knew Cal Rayburn, it was crazy. But we're up there, Rayburn rolls the thing, and we're straightened out. Well, George Smith, him and Warner, they're George and this was kind of neat. I, I remember he says, John, he marked it with a pen, says, let's cut this out and we'll do this. Well, the outriggers didn't have skids on it, so I took 90 degree elbows, exhaust elbows, and welded it on, and George is helping me in this and Warner. And then it, we wrecked it a bunch of times and got tore up. But anyway, the neatest thing happened today. All of that went on in 1970, 44 years today. My wife told me, I didn't know. George Smith down here, the Great Ghost, they needed help, and we're down there cutting their body up. And George Smith says, John, cut this right here where he had marked with a pen 44 years later. And that, that, that made tears for me because same people, you know, it was me. But uh, yeah, was thanks to Santa Claus and everybody, and thanks to SMS, they helped us a ton. And it's been a little neat. Thank you. Say a few words? No. Okay. <laughs> Just a couple. Uh, well, I come here in 64 with water in water, and then I didn't come back for, I came back a couple years later, and I, I didn't come back for years until water started coming back. And he said, well, come on up and visit. That was four years ago, and then I've been coming every year in the last four years. Boy come, and uh, he's running a, a bike here last year and this year, and we're having a good time. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know if it'll be a couple, but um, for those who don't know me, I live in Portland, Oregon, and have been there for most all of my life. Um, speed as a little kid was always something that just kind of filled my body wanting to know why these things work how they worked and just that drive that just as you all know because you're here you're you've got a drive and you're trying to excel and you're trying to figure out why it, it continues to do what it does and and how can i make it better and when I was 16, I got my first Sportster, and uh, I was at Wood Woodburn Drag Strip, and uh, that's when I first let the clutch out on it, at a drag strip. So from 1968 till 02, I drag raced most of the time, and um, it, it's, it's been a, an evolving thing where we ran a gas bike, 90-inch motor, and it had the 4-inch M&H slick on it, George remembers those. <laughs> and um, it, it was a thing where with the sports or transmissions, they were always breaking and constantly giving us problems. And so at the time, my dad 
who I have to say right now, I would never be here in the business of, as I am right now without his support. He was everything to me, and he still is everything to me. And so we talked about it, and we developed two 90-inch motors and a twin cam, or a twin engine dragster. And we worked it and worked it. In 1976, we went 870s with the thing. We were the first gas motors to break into the eights at that point. And um, so that evolved, and I met Ron Dickey earlier on in those years, um, probably 1974, when we were traveling through Des Moines because we were having radiator problems. And uh, he was, him and Shorty Axtell at the time, they were really gracious helping us to get the radiator out, getting into a radiator shop so we could continue on to West Salem, uh, West Salem uh, Ohio at that point. And um, so it was, it was a thing where we continued on this venture and um, we, we found that uh, we could only go so fast to the double and uh, uh, because of transmissions and lack of, of those types of things, it was only two speed lines that I could run at the time and there was nothing developed really at that point. So I got married at that point, um, uh, had kids, at that point in my life, I couldn't write, you know, three kids, a dog, and a wife on the back of one motorcycle, and so I took time off, and we did other things, four-wheeling, three-wheeling, and so forth, on the dunes. So Ron calls me up in 92 and says, I've got a C-class bike, Sportster, that uh, I think will set a record, and we're going to run it in uh, Bowling Green, Kentucky. And he says, would you like to ride it? I said, well, let me think about it. At the time, I was remarried to my wife on that. And I said, what would you think of me doing this? And she said, go for it. And uh, so at that point, we went down to Kentucky and, and the record was, was um, uh, I think about a, just about a 1080 or something like that. But by the time we got done with it, it was down about 1040s. And um, so it began our relationship as racing together. And uh, at that point we raced uh, the C-Class bike, we developed dual card heads for it and so forth. And uh, then we went to Rockingham, North Carolina. And uh, at that time we became, I believe, the first um, gas bike as an 88-inch Sportster going through the quarter mile at 974 without wheelie bars or air shifters. And uh, it was, it was a, a great thing for us at that time. And then from that time, uh, we kind of let the bike kind of retire, and then Bill Hammond approached me about uh, riding the Pro Stock bike. And um, so it evolved, and that's, that became the, uh, the bike that I continued with riding. And getting on the bike for the first time, it, it certainly drove me, because I'd never ridden a, a white tire bike before. It was always narrow, rounded tires, and so forth. And um, it was one of those things where you let the clutch out, and you just hope to God that you were going to go straight down the end of the line because it was a different riding style completely. And uh, so by the end of the first year, finally things started settling in. And then in 98, um, we kept developing the cylinder heads and the carburetors and so forth. We, we finally broke into the, uh, uh, the seven second barrier at, uh, uh, Rich, I guess it was Richmond, Virginia, I believe at that point. Um, and, uh, we broke it in 793, and it, it was just, it was an, an awesome thing for us as a team, as privateers, to be able to do that. And like uh, George was saying, uh, Dave Fazell, I mean, great rivals. I mean, it was uh, a thing where the, the competition was always so good, and, and it just made you strive and, and work and work and work to, to develop yourselves. And uh, at the end of 02, uh, Bill had cancer. And so that was a five-year stint for us riding the post-doc bike. And we knew that at that point there was hospital bills, doctor bills to pay for him. He's still alive, he's doing great, and he, he beat the Hodgkins. And uh, so, you know, life is really good for him. And, um, but Ron, through the years, has always been a friend of mine. And uh, so we just started uh, running the Bonneville stuff uh, just on and off. This is our fifth time that we have come to Bonneville as a, as a team. And um, we, you know, we, we have our successes, we have our failures, 
but we learn by those things, and that's what keeps us moving forward. But it's always, a, in my life, it's always been a support system of friends and, and the relationships that you build. Records are fantastic, they are, but by and large, it's relationships and friendships that you build that, that are everything in your lives. So just always keep that in your mind whenever you're doing this stuff, because uh, those are the things that mean more than a trophy. And uh, just thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rock Nicky, would you like to say a few words? <clears throat> Tom and I have talked about this a lot, but his, but his motivation is to make sure that the young kids get to talk to the legends, you know, the, the, the cool people, and pass this down. You know, because motorcycles so cool. As a sidebar, knowing Tom, and he, he really has done a great job, you've probably noticed he talks real loud. Real loud. And he lives in a town called Siren. Do, does anybody else see a connection here? Okay. But anyway, uh, Doc Dyke started Axe Tales, basically, it was Dyke. And he sold it to Shorty Axe Tales. And Doc moved out to Colorado, if I remember right. So I didn't get a chance to know Doc very well. And Shorty was kind of a, he was cantankerous. He could really irritate people. And, uh, but he was a real good guy. I liked him. He, the place was a dungeon. And uh, I almost didn't go to work there. But uh, I decided I'd give it a try. I was working in a machine shop. But uh, anyway, uh, he didn't last very long. He got cancer and passed away. So I basically had run. I didn't know anything. And some people say I still don't know much. But... To go back to what Tom's trying to do is, if it wasn't for Baisley, Wes, and Dan, and then the old people, I call them old people, but at that time it was, it was uh, Elmer Trapp, Jackie, Pete Hill, Jim McClure. So in those days, you just, uh, we were little, always stayed little. You'd run the lathe, and if the phone rang too many times, you'd have to shut the lathe off, and you'd just talk to people, but you could get to talk to this huge amount of people that would share. That was a cool thing. So you could just sponge up. You could learn anything you want if you listen, and that's that's really what done. And what Tom's trying to do here is pass this down, make sure it goes down, and keep these kids interested. And he's doing a, he's doing a good job. So I've been very lucky. Yeah.
designing and making new products. And, and uh, George was always behind us pushing really hard. And uh, of course we got our feet up with the brakes on sometimes. But <clears throat> those are the tough days. But if you ask anybody there at the shop, those were the, the best days where you really, really, as George would say, know, knew how to have fun. And on a side note for that, uh, talking about fun, we could be working, we could work 10 hours straight. If, you, if, you, if there's three minutes in that 10 hours that you were screwing around, you shouldn't have been, George would come out of the office and catch you guys. <laughs> You'd be very soft. So working around George, you better be work. We did, we had a lot of fun. Uh, uh, today we were messing around the track and George was there and helping out and it reminded me of, of uh, back when I started to ride tram. We uh, had been to the salt, another rider was riding tram and uh, anyway, it didn't work out real well and we brought the motorcycle home and uh, I was going to be the rider at the tram. So George sits me on the motorcycle and says, uh, where's your feet comfortable? And I said, well, right about here. And he says, no, they're gonna be there. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> anyway, um, let's see. I gotta move ahead on that thing. George has earned the respect of every employee at s, &S racers alike. Anyway, uh, I just have to say the reason I've enjoyed uh, a long career, and like I said, 40 years I've been at SNS Cycle, it's a little over. Uh, I had the honor of, because George took me under his wing, took me to the drag races, uh, introduced me to a lot of people. Um, a lot of people that aren't here, but certainly the people that are here was uh, uh, because George believed in me and said that I could do it. And so uh, we went out in the world and we raced. I would like to thank George, not only for all that he's done for the industry, but personally for the opportunities and the doors he's opened for me. And uh, thanks, George. I'd like to have uh, Chris Rebus come up and say a couple words. It's uh, quite an honor to be here tonight amongst all these legends uh, out in the audience and up on the stage. And it's uh, it's my fifth year actually out at Bonneville. And I know Tom wanted me to talk more about the experiences that I had with Big George, as we always called him, at the NHRA level. And I had uh, started my drag racing career on a motorcycle back in, I think it was 1995. I bought a 92 Sportster and started hopping it up a little bit. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it evolved into being able to, I, I had a, you know, obviously an SNS carburetor, you have to have that. And then we did some stroker flywheels in it, added some body work to it. And I got it to run down in the low 920s and uh, took some track championships away from all the Suzuki guys that were local. And, uh, you know, we felt really good about beating all them guys up all the time. We did some stuff in the uh, NHRA Divisional, got number three for that. And then we went and built a new bike, and it was, I had a guy that was going to give me some money, and we built a chassis, and we were going to try for pro stock. You know, we were watching guys like Dan Baisley and uh, Dave Fazell and um, Rick Manny was just coming onto the scene at the time, and all these guys were really fast, and I thought, well, you know, it's actually a pretty small field at the time, so I'm just going to build me a bike and show up, and I think this is going to be pretty easy, just like I've done on my other stuff. So I called up uh, Jody Anderson and all the guys over there at SNS, and they got me hooked up with an engine, built it in my garage at home, did all the little clearances and all this stuff. It was kind of a rough piece, but it's like that. It's a builder's piece that you buy. It's not an assembled engine like a crate motor, like the incredible stuff they've got now. So I put it all together and I actually got it to start and run after we had the cams welded the second time because the first time I had no idea what I was doing. And I got everything all together, put some carburetors together on it, had no idea what I was doing. Went out to the first event, there was five bikes. Rick Manny was number one qualifier, I believe. And uh, the guy that I raced, uh, 
I can't remember how it went. Anyways, I ended up in the final round because Rick had broke his primary drive, and I ended up in the final round, got the uh, runner-up position on my first race out, but I noticed my transmission wouldn't shift right. And so I kept asking everybody, what do we do for this transmission? And Rick says, you gotta call George. He knows all about those transmissions. You gotta find out what's going on. And I was like, George, who? George Smith, call him. Like, you mean the George Smith? The, like, the guy that owns s and &S? I'm going to call him? I, I'm nobody. I'm this podunk guy, you know, out in Central California. I had no right to call. And he goes, no, here's his number. Call him up. So we were at the garage late working. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's like 9 o'clock at night. Isn't he in Wisconsin? Isn't that like 11 o'clock or so at night? It's a cell number. They gave me a cell number. You probably don't even remember this. But I called the number, and he answered. And I was like, oh, I, I did not expect an answer. I was going to leave a message. <laughs> and so I actually got to talk to the George Smith that night for the very first time. And he said, no, you can't use that transmission. Throw it away. We're running, we're running all this new stuff with the Pro Stock. You know, forget all that stuff. Don't do any of that. You got to start running this other stuff. This was in like 2004, and, and of course he's talking about the NHRA Pro Stock stuff. And you know, like I said, I built my own stuff and extended all my credit cards to buy all of this stuff, and had no reason to ever think about being in the NHRA Pro Stock. So I made it through half of that season and got two runner-up finishes in that class that year. And uh, in the middle of the season, a guy came to me and said, hey, we're gonna build a pro stock team, and uh, I think I want you to write it, because I've been watching you, you're not that fast, but you always show up, you always have a good attitude when you lose, you just seem like you're a pretty solid guy, and I think I want you to be my writer. And so the guy actually, we talked a little bit more, found out he was also from Central California, we went to dinner, and I said, you know, I really appreciate this opportunity. It's huge, but I'm not going to ride a Suzuki. And I know that's all there is in the NHRA in 2004, except for that one guy, Chip Ellis, on the bike at Star Racing, G-Squared Motorsports at the time. And uh, so the guy says, no, we're buying the first pro stock in the box package deal. George Smith, George Bryce are building these bikes to sell. We're buying one, we want you to write it. I said, man, I'm in. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I really have this opportunity? So then I went to the George Bryce Racing School out in Georgia, passed out with flying colors. Went to the first event out at, uh, in Gainesville. It was the AHDRA event. That was supposed to be my big test. I'm like, the first time ever on the bike. So I get on the bike. You know, I, George talked about the engine specs and, you know, five and an eighth inch bore. This thing's just massive, right? Building aluminum, it's just an incredible piece of machinery. It's artwork, really, is what it is. He didn't tell you, there are 380 horsepower out of two cylinders. And so I'm going over all this in my mind. You know, the, the, the school bikes were about 250. This is like 380 horsepower. And I'm supposed to get on this, grab a whole handful of throttle, at 6,000 RPM and then throw away the clutch. And let's see what happens. <laughs> well, that is kind of how that first run went. And uh, Dan, you were talking about make sure it's pointed straight. Well, that time it wasn't. I veered off to the right, got really close to the wall, leaned it up on the edge of the tire, started shifting through the gears. I made it through all the gears, went like 735, which it should have went seven, probably 05 at the time. Turned off the track, I was like, that was close, I almost died. <laughs> and I was kind of proud that I didn't, you know, I was like, Man. I was like not that disappointed in my run. I pull off the track, they bring me back to the trailer, George Smith's standing there. He says, you are not ready to ride that bike. You're out. Wait a minute, you don't own my team. <laughs> He's just the guy that supplies the parts. My team owner's over here, and he goes, well, George Smith says you can't ride the bike, you can't ride the bike. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> so I was like, well, I mean, I'm a hired rider on this bike. It's my bike, what are we doing? He 
He says, well, you're staying behind. You're going to do more runs on this bike and some school bikes. I stayed at, uh, in America's Georgia for two weeks. Got back on a school bike. On the sidewalk next to the shop in America's Georgia, it was maybe 150 feet long or so. I did 52 launches in two days through first year, all of first year, with you know full throttle, throw the clutch away, front tire in the air, leaving a black patch. Me and Chip Ellis, he pushed the bike back and he'd say, okay, get ready and do it again. And I made 52 passes in two days. And the options were on this sidewalk, over here is the building. So it's about a six foot sidewalk. Over here, the row of motorhomes were parked. So you can either hit the building, hit the motorhomes, or go straight. 52 perfect straight passes. <laughs> and so I did get to go through my first event, and we had some mechanical problems. Um, I just barely missed qualifying, even though we were breaking crankshafts at about half track. And uh, it was just an incredible thing. On my third event out, George and Big George and Little George, Bryce, how we knew them apart, uh, came into the trailer, gave us a really good tune-up on the third event out at, in Atlanta. I was number four qualifier and went all the way to the final round and got runner-up to the Harley team. And it was, uh, it was just incredible because George was helping with everything that we were doing. My racing career really progressed through the next couple of years. He talked about Pomona 2008. 2008 was absolutely the pinnacle port portion of my entire racing career. I mean, you know, I had dreamed my whole life watching these guys on TV in the NHRA racing and knew all the names, you know, all these guys were legends. You had um, people, Steve Johnson, I mean, he's still out there, he's an old guy. I raced for and with Matt Smith and all the guys that you can mention that are champions and former champions. I got a chance to not only just, you know, race against them, meet them, have relationships with them. We were really big, you know, everything that we did in the trailer when I was hired was about the relationships part. And that's the biggest thing that I love so much about George Smith is the relationships that he continues to nurture all the time. It's, and it is generational, Tom, because now my daughter is racing out here at Bonneville. And besides her immediate family, her biggest coach and cheerleader really is George Smith. And it's, it's pretty phenomenal to see that. And, uh, you know, he, George has been instrumental in so many things in my life, personally, not only professionally, but personally. You know, he's always a phone call away, and it's not the awkward phone call like before, where it's the legendary George Smith. He's, he's a great guy. He's just my friend, you know, and it's, it's such a huge thing. I mean, I, I love him like family for sure, and he's been instrumental in my business. Where, you know, we built a business. We started a business in 2008. I got hired on the Pro Stock Racing team in 2008. 2008 was kind of our year. Everything really went together in 2008 for us. And starting our business, George has always been there as a business mentor and called me up, you know, how are you doing? You know, what's your numbers like? Are you in the black? What are you doing? You know, he wanted to know details all the time about what we were doing and uh, kept me really on par with the things that he expected out of us. And we continue to work at that, and um, we're, you know, obviously we're very much involved with the things that SNS is doing. We're testing some new parts for them, even this week. Hopefully, if we get some more runs in, and um, got some really neat stuff. I'm parked next to the SNS truck out there on the salt. You guys need to come by and check out the, the bike that we have. That we have. Uh, I actually asked permission from Dan Kinsey. I said, "Do you mind if I borrow the Tramp name? It's such a legendary thing." So we have the turbo tramp out of my trailer, and it's the first big effort with the turbo. And uh, man, that's a learning curve. <laughs> but uh, you know, this is this is stuff that George is not sitting still with stuff. 
you know, we're just talking today with Justin and the guys from the race department. You know, we're learning about the turbo stuff right now, but George doesn't want to just stop it. Let's learn about the turbo. I've got a supercharger too that I want you guys to try out. You know? So he's already starting to buy all these extra parts and all this stuff and uh, just continue to learn all the time. And those are the things that I really appreciate about not only SNS, but especially George Smith and the things that he does to continue to push the entire industry. And realistically, the only time you get a fast Harley Davidson is if it has SNS parts on it. I mean, it's true. I don't care what the Screaming Eagle brand thinks that they try to do, but it's kind of a joke. You want to go fast, you've got to put the SNS stuff on. There's so many parts available with ported heads and big throttle bodies and I mean, massive stuff that's going to really rock. So, uh, thank you guys very much for your time. Hello, everybody. By virtue of my age, I was lucky enough to be around the very beginnings quite a bit of this. I remember driving to Blue Island, Illinois, picking up the very first Stroker Sportster engine that SNS did. I also remember being asked at the US 30 drag strip to test the carburetor. I also remember being asked to bring a carburetor to Bonneville in 1967, which was the first SNS carburetor that ever existed. It was handmade. Even the air horn was a spun steel part, and fortunately set four records with it. I remember working with George and others on the Streamliner project in 1970, etc., etc. All of that was done with George's father and mother. However, what we saw today in the effort to help Tim Fisher with Grey Ghost 2 was a continuation of that kind of thinking of being at the front with the effort, the enthusiasm, and the parts. And I commend you, George, for your help individually, your help to others, and I hope you stay happy and healthy. We all like to see Keep in mind, I'm just a regular guy who likes to go fast and uh, build stuff that works. And uh, Evan Warner, Floyd Baker, Uncle Sid, Dan Kinsey, now the new breed, Gene DeLass, Jeff Bailey, Justin Bramstead. Um, uh, what do you say? Just uh, when we wanted to, we wanted to see if we could build the first car to go 200 in the quarter. So we were going to build a turbo Harley, and that lasted about a week. You know, just didn't get it for me. So we put a Whipple charger on it, and if anybody heard that bike run, it's probably the loudest bike on the planet. And uh, we went, we were at Dinwiddie, Richmond, in May of 1995, and, and finally cracked 200. It was fun. Um, I don't know how Chris is going to run tomorrow. He's got a, uh, what is that, a Diana chassis? Diana chassis is one of our one, 142s. We've got a 142 motor that we're building that's, uh, that's a, it'll fit in any late model chassis. And uh, we decided to put a turbo on it. Actually, I didn't decide, but. Scott Schovel and Bailey and the guys from uh, SNS now decided. So we're up around 270 horse with it. I don't know how it's going to go pretty fast. I told Chris, put some weight on it, get some weight on it. You're going to be spinning the tire. Of course, he didn't do it. So we're going to find out tomorrow. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, they talk about uh, uh, the Grey Ghost. I looked at it and, and I didn't like the way they had the intake crack and I didn't like the way the fairing was mounted. So, but what we did, what we spent all the afternoon is uh, redoing it. Hope that it works. But, um, 
It's been, it's really been a ride. I was 37 when dad died and I've been uh, running SMS for 35 years. Time flies when you have fun. I retired uh, July 15th because I, I realized a few years ago I got Parkinson. Are you familiar with Parkinson? You uh, lose your balance, lose your stamina, movement disorder. After riding motorcycles for 50 years, I had to quit riding. But uh, I'm handling it pretty well. It can always be a lot worse. So we got we got we just got some good guys in the wings here. So thank you for all the kind words. But I uh, I just soon stay you know, kind of stay in the shadows and just make stuff happen. You know, because it's embarrassing sometimes to do all this stuff. Seriously. Uh, I have one more thing to admit, George. We're getting down to the wire here. I did shut my eyes, both of them, one time. Thank you. Now, you see these two deals up here? We're going to have Legend sign them, and we're going to auction them at the banquet, because Anybody that's been here a while knows the old museum is gone. And that's, uh, I want to see the museum built before I die. And S and S designed these t-shirts. They're for sale over in the corner. And the museum means a lot to me and it means a lot to everybody here. Anybody that's raised out here, you either when you get out here, there's two things. You love it or you hate it. And it isn't five minute or a 10 minute deal, you know, immediately. And everybody tell, like the first record we set, I cried like a baby. And uh, that was the most important one. And that was, this is my 20th year out here. I'm sorry I'm not quite as old as Warner and Jim Weinweber, but it's a special place and you know that, and I want to continue. The reason I do this, like Ron Dickey said, is the young guys have got to learn this. If we didn't listen to young, when we were kids growing up in Wisconsin, if we didn't listen to somebody older than us, we got knocked in the head and knocked out. And you learn, you sit down, you shut up, and you listen. And even when I came to the first year at SCTA, they told us, we, they really liked us because we listened. And uh, George, what was that guy from Texas' name? Elrod. Yeah. Uh, we were sitting. Uh, Tom Elrod. We were sitting Tom racing. Elrod. Tom Elrod, right? Tom Elrod. Yeah. Yep. We were racing, and, and he's he got up in the morning and he was drinking lemonade. We were racing, and we raced and raced and raced. And he's sitting there, and I'm looking at him, I go, God, who's this idiot? You know, we're racing. We didn't know who he was. So then finally he says, Santa Claus, come here. And I go, no, I'm too busy. Santa Claus, come here and drink some lemonade. <laughs> okay. So I went over there and sit and drink lemonade. And he goes, tell your crew to come here. This is about 2 o'clock. We raced all day long. It kept going slower and slower and slower. So we, we, uh, Got the crew over there, he started telling stories. He's from Texas, could really tell some good stories. New George. So he says, I'm gonna tell you a secret. And I go, okay, about four o'clock, about four to four, you mosey on up to the start line at the SET event. He says, the wind picks up, blows you right through the goddamn course, it will be the fastest you go all day long. And we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we do it, get up there. We gained 10 miles an hour, and I go, you got to be the smartest SOB I know. <laughs> and we go, what other little secrets? Well, I can't, t I'm not going to tell the rest of them, but, he, but that's where the knowledge that we learned from them guys. And um, Ed Mayberry took me under his wings, and, and I, the reason I did this is because he was one of the smartest men I've ever met out here. And he liked me, and 
we learned so ungodly much. You look at our motorcycle, we got training wheels. You know what? Our bikes never fall over. And everybody laughs about it, but we can roll them and people can sit on them, stand on them, whatever. But there's a secret he had, and I'll tell one other story about Ed Mayberry. John Monano was a hell of a racer. And he was there racing at SETA, and oil line broke and uh, started a little fire and it, got, it wasn't real bad, but it was burning his leg. And they go, Jesus, John, why don't you pull over? He goes, Ed would have killed me. He goes, what do you mean kill you? I wasn't through the measured mile yet. I got to set a record. <laughs> and he did. So that, that was a passion and I want to continue that and then hopefully somebody will take this over when I'm dead and keep doing this alive because it's a special deal. And we need the museum, and hopefully you can bid on that stuff and buy t-shirts. And I want to thank Big Steve from s, &S George from s, &S and then not just s, s but everybody that races motorcycles. It's a very, it's a, like I call it, it's a family reunion you want to go to. And that's what it is. And, and if they're not, they're bullshit because the people will do anything in the world to help you and that means everything to me, and I think it means everybody here. And we'd like to ask more questions, but I think these guys are tired, you guys are tired, we gotta go racing tomorrow. So, I wanna thank you, and it means a lot to me for this. This is our third annual now, and it started out at the bar, and it went here, and it's getting better every year. We just need more people, but somebody was bitching and moaning today about sitting, and I go, yeah, I see what you need, but you know what? If it would have rained, we'd be going home. So we're still racing, so have fun, be safe, and set some records. And thank you for coming tonight. And I need you guys to sign these posters, and you can bullshit with them when they come out. But thank you very, very much. <laughs>